please remain standing for our first hymn this morning on page 352. It's me, it's me, O Lord, page 352. Affirmation of faith this morning is the Apostles' Creed found in your bulletin and on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mount Zion United Methodist Church. Great to have everyone here with us this morning. And joining us virtually as well. So welcome to everyone. Do we have any first time guests with us this morning? If so, please raise your hand. Some back here. Very nice to have you all with us at Sunday school and in service today. Thank you for being with us this morning. It's a great crowd considering all the work that was put into the barbecue <laughs> yeah. um, on Friday and Saturday. So thank you very much for being here. Let me direct your attention to the flowers this morning. The flowers are to the glory of God and in honor of Joanne and Walter Kane's 61st wedding anniversary, a place of love from their family. Congratulations to Uncle Walter and Aunt Jo. There are some announcements on page six in your bulletin, but we'll take those now as well. Any announcements? Carol? Uh, next Sunday is Laity <coughs> Sunday. So make sure you are here for that to watch our people in action. And then the Sunday after that, October 30th, is Family Fun Night, and that starts at 5. So uh, decorate the doors of your Sunday school classes. If there are some empty rooms, feel free to decorate those too and put a purse in there. Bring your candy, wear your costumes. There's a chili contest. There's a dessert contest. And it's a chocolate theme contest, if you're going to participate in that. So uh, lots of fun, October 30th, 5 o'clock. Thanks, Carol. Laity Sunday coming up next Sunday, the 23rd. So please come out for that for our uh, morning service at 11 o'clock. And then Family Fun Night on October 30th, starting at 5 o'clock. Um, and if you want to be a, a part of the... Um, 
dessert cook-off. It's uh, chocolate-themed, so please keep that in mind for October 30th at 5 o'clock. Alan? Yes, sir. The uh, ministry of Project 1213 continues to grow. 74 people, I think, was the number that you provided there. So continues to grow, and the need for uh, the canned goods continues to grow. So please continue your faithfulness to bring those things in. And you can also uh, provide some giving above uh, kind of regular tithes and offerings to help support that cause as well. So just mark that on your, um, on your checks. Wayne? Fight it out. Like, like the barbecue and that. I know you all get tired. I say the same thing every year. <laughs> but what a great congregation we have. There's just a lot of skill and talent in this congregation. We can all work together as a team. You know, that's the key thing. I know I keep saying that. We're getting off the well old machine. Everybody, we don't have to tell them what to do. Today, God to praise him and glory. Absolutely. Let's see what the Spirit says first. Yeah. And then yeah. just appreciate the, the work that you do for the Lord. And I do have no pew left, but we do have some arms and boots, several pounds of boots. And we have one whole feeding pig. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, it's exciting. So, I'll, and I'll read some of those back as I remember them from. The, or, go ahead, Mary. I was just going to say, sorry, we'll be across the street selling anytime you need. If you want to meet us over there, come to the window and uh, we'll make some money. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah, I'll share some of those numbers so those of you joining us virtually can hear them. So $5,303 was the net profit. So thank you very much for the, um, really, your just dedication and faithfulness uh, to the barbecue. We couldn't remember how long it's been, but uh, it's been a long time, and, and every year it just gets better and better, and, and the, the machine gets better, more well-oiled. <laughs> I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but um, it, it, it really is uh, just amazing to see all the work that goes in uh, to make that a success and what a beautiful day it was for the barbecue yesterday also so thank you very much for your dedication thanks to wayne for his leadership and the barbecue committee um, felt a little different without diana here and we were thinking about her um, but she'll be out there next year with us so we put her on the prayer list also but uh, very successful barbecue and uh, that would not have happened without the, the faithfulness of the people sitting in this room so. other announcements How about prayer concerns or praises? Barbara? Uh, Gary and Susie Brownstein. Gary and Susie Brownstein? Yes, ma'am. Elaine Warren. Elaine Warren. Bill. Trish Allen. Trish Allen. Marsha? Uh, Terry, Terry Dorsey. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Virginia Orr. Virginia, 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 Virginia Orr and Karen Smith. Yes, sir. Brian? Unspoken. Unspoken requests. Matt? Sarah, uh, Sarah never called uh, and said she was coming by, but she said uh, the Inman family came to the podcast over there. The Inman family, yes, sir. Nita? Diana McCurdy. Diana McCurdy. Yes, sir. The family of, uh, and friends of Terry Holsenbag. The Holsenbag family. The Lennox family. Alan? Linda Meyer and Barbara Hodgson. Linda Meyer and Barbara Hodgson. Any others? If there are, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Praise for that and be able to, to come here this morning. Yes, ma'am. If there are no more, we'll take these to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, I, uh, I take issue with the first hymn because your pastor, <laughs> the pastor of this church needs prayer too. And so uh, I pray... Oh, God, for these things that have been lifted to you, for these situations, God, be with us and supply us with our every need, for we depend fully on you and no one else. Sweet, sweet spirit, breathe into us your power to discern the right choices and the paths for our lives. Breathe into us your peace and patience in a world that wants us to make decisions fast and rashly. Breathe into us a sense of value and purpose as your children. Breathe into us the possibility of new life now as part of our eternal life with you. Sweet, sweet spirit, help us to breathe out the vitriol the snappy judgments, the condescension that permeates our own thinking. May we let go of the negativity that does not shape us for the better, but drags us down, O oh God. May we breathe in the sweetness of life that you have for us. Sweet, sweet spirit, we pray these things in your son's holy and precious name who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Continue our singing this morning on page 451, Be Thou My Vision, page 451, please stand. Please be seated. At this time, I invite our ushers to come forward for our offering. I want to reiterate, I don't want to uh, be, beat a dead horse, but I am so just thrilled with the response that we had at the barbecue. To see y'all in action, uh, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen or imagined. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm just so proud of you all. I, I really am. And uh, I, I'm thankful to be, a, be a, to be your pastor. I really am. And so uh, let us go to God in prayer as we re- prepare to return just a little bit back to what is already God's. Holy God, as we offer our gifts to you this day, we pray that in our giving we might be reconnected to the reason why we follow and the reason why we, gr- why, why we give. You called us to be disciples who make disciples. All in. Knowing who we are and who you are and why we are following. Help us avoid that which distracts, the desire to hear the things that please us and make the road easier, but that will not bring us to the kingdom of justice, mercy, and compassion that you desire for us, O God. In Christ we pray, our guiding light. Amen.
Our script reading this morning comes from the book of 2 Timothy, verses chapter 3, verse 14, through chapter 4, verse 5. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. At this time, we'd like for the children to come down for the children's message. That was to everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, good. They are awake out there, aren't they? We had a busy day yesterday. All right. So look what I brought. What is this? Mac and cheese. Okay, that's good. Um, does anybody know how to make this? You do know how to make it? Okay, can you tell me how to make it? Do you know how much water? Above the mac and cheese, okay. Microwave for five minutes. I've never been in, okay. Well, okay. You know how to do it with the pot. Okay, so after we cook the noodles, then what do I do? After we cook the pasta. Oh, then you add the Marinate. We're using the word marinate down here. <laughs> Oh, so you're adding. Wow. Okay, well. I, I was, I was going to say, let's just follow the directions on the side of the box. Yes, he did, because, see, the box says a half a tablespoon of butter and only three tablespoons of milk. No, okay. And, okay. And then it has that powdered fake cheese in here. And so you've, you know, you've all ramped it up with your fancy Parmesan, Asiago, mozzarella thing you got going. Okay. So I'm going to have to move on from my mac and cheese lesson. So let's just talk about directions then. <laughs> so what if we don't have directions on how to play a game? Or what if we don't have directions on how to get somewhere? Do you think directions might be important? Yes, directions are important, even if we jazz them up a little bit. So we have to have some directions. Like when we take medicine, right, we have to follow the directions. That would be very, very important. So what about your life? What are the directions? What's the rule book that you should be following for your life? All right, I'm ready. Don't lie. Okay, good, good. So do what, what kind of 
So like this box has it on the side, what I'm supposed to do. Okay, where can you look? The Bible, that is exactly right. So Drew read to us in 2 Timothy 3, you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So this Bible is like our, our directions, right? So we've got directions on a box. We've got directions when we open a game. We've got directions when we look at a map. We've got directions when we take our medicine that the doctor gives us. But God gives us directions in the Bible about how to live our lives. And you're right. It includes don't lie and don't steal and take care of your parents. It has all kinds of rules that you are supposed to follow. The Bible will never ever let you down. The Bible is always right, and the Bible is always there for you, okay? All right, we're going to say a prayer before we go. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you for the Bible that teaches us what to do. Thank you for the directions that you send to us, to our hearts, and let us always go out and do your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Carol. This time we ask you to stand up, greet your neighbor, tell him God loves you.
All scripture. It's God breathed. I don't think that's what the translation you heard. Before he goes, I just want to tell that young man, you made, you make some good macaroni and cheese, I guarantee it. <laughs> Mama, I know you're proud. <laughs> amen, amen. All scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the person of God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Got to say, I've heard this one all the time when I was growing up in the Church of Christ. I heard this probably about every Sunday. Uh, it was a favorite of one of our Sunday school teachers. Uh, whether it was Paul who wrote this book of Second Timothy uh, or not is actually up for debate by the scholars of the pastoral letters. But do you think whoever wrote this, whether it was Paul or not, knew exactly how much time and how much writing would be dedicated to these words and spent on this particular verse, verse 2 Timothy 3.16? Do a quick Google search and you're going to find, I think, 15,200,000 hits was what I saw this morning. You'll get a bunch of wildly, wildly, whew, my, my tongue's not working this morning. Wildly different literature on this. Most Christians I know, though not certainly every, every Christian in the entire world, would agree that scripture is inspired by God. The word inspired literally means God breathed. Sometimes we need an educational sermon. And this is one of those times. <laughs> because even though these, might, words, these words might seem straightforward, these words are not interpreted as easily as they read. Because they involve some things that we don't understand. Metaphysics. <laughs> and they make us look at how we receive this book that all of us here hold as our ultimate authority. Hopefully. Do you? I hope you do. I do. It's the ultimate authority for our theological reflection. This chunk of scripture makes us ask a couple of questions, and so I'm going to start with the easiest one and then move to the harder ones. First, what scripture is it that the writer, I'm just going to call him Paul, that Paul is talking about in here as inspired by God. And here's what it can't mean. If we're doing a strict, literal reading of the text, it cannot mean anything other than the Old Testament writings. And likely the Septuagint at that, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text that was used in most synagogues at the time. The reason why for that, by the way, is because... <coughs> At the time of the writing of this letter, they didn't have anything else besides the Old Testament. Some of the Gospels may have been in circulation, but it was unlikely that they'd read any more than one at that point. Many of the things that Jesus, uh, about Jesus, that Timothy would have learned would have been passed down through oral tradition to Timothy, probably through Paul. And Paul would have received that from, well, some of it's divine revelation. Some of it is through talking to his sources like Peter and other folks who had met Jesus, the 12, probably. The only writings available to Timothy were writings found in the Old Testament, though, which the church has historically upheld to be useful for instruction in Christian faith. And I don't know how you could read the Old Testament and not think that. It is, uh, it's quite the book. The only writings available was the Old Testament. So very much along these lines is this point. 
the Bible's canon was not formed officially until the Council of Trent in 1546. 1,500 years after some of these books were probably starting to get written. It was in the fourth session of the Council of Trent, by the way. Now, there's a complete list of the books of the Bible that are available to us in the Easter letter of a man named Athanasius. And I've got a picture of him. He was a bishop of Rome. And he wrote this Easter letter... And in this Easter letter is a complete list of the books of the New Testament. Now, it did add a couple of things that did not make its way into our canon, like uh, the book of Tobit and other apocryphal or pseudepigraphal works. Those are uh, works that you will not find in our Protestant Bible. But let's just say that those books had never been put together to make what we have today in the form of this, which is the most publicized book, pu- published book in the entire world. They didn't have it back then. And yet, I think, all of us here, hopefully, would lift this up and say, yes, I believe that this book in its entirety, not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well, are the inspired writings from the word of God. I do not, I do think, let me be very clear, I do think that God inspired the writings of the Old Testament, the prophets, the Torah, even some of the hard wisdom literature like Job, the prophets. But importantly, this use of scripture is right on point here in 2 Timothy, which is it's useful for teaching, for reproof, for rebuking, some translations say, for correction, for training in righteousness. Absolutely, 100%. This is what scripture is used for, and actually this is the point of our scripture today. The next question I, 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 it makes me think of is uh, one that doesn't have a great answer because none of us have met the biblical writers and found out through interviewing them what exactly their writing process was like. Uh, Here's an interpretation of some of the writing processes, by the way. Uh, This is the inspiration of St. Matthew, I believe. Uh, The the, the former one, the first one I had up, is also the inspiration of St. Matthew. This is by Rembrandt. Uh, I love this one. This is one of my favorites. And here's another inspiration of St. Matthew. All of them involve an angel, right? How in the world do we get the Gospels? That is a question that this brings up. How in the world do we get the Holy Scriptures? How do we get the Bible? How are these words inspired? If you have a good answer to that, uh, let me know. Uh, There are a couple of models available to us. The first is something called the verbal plenary method or the dictation method, Uh, and it's kind of like this. So uh, the gospel writer would get the words almost directly from the mouth of God. Some even say that God would have taken control of the pen somehow of the gospel writer or the scripture writer or whatever part of scripture that you are encountering. And there's some legitimate credence to that. In scripture, for instance, uh, in the New Testament, the disciples are all worried about what in the world they're going to say once Jesus has gone on to be with God uh, eternally. Once Jesus is no longer with them. So they're worried about what they're going to say, and Jesus tells them, do not worry I will give you the very words that you are to say. Very similar to what Pharaoh uh, and Moses have going on. God says, uh, Moses says, I don't know exactly what to say. I'm not a gifted speaker, God. This is Exodus chapter 4, by the way. I'm not a gifted speaker. I don't don't know exactly what I'm going to say to this man, Pharaoh, this king. And God says, I will give you the words. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 says, This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by, in, in, by human wisdom, but in words taught to us by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. So, I do take it to mean that there is at least some kind of divine revelation going on in helping us form the words that we are to, A, preach, but also what the biblical writers wrote. On the other hand, there are other signs in Scripture that point to another kind of method of inspiration. Uh, this one would be called the dynamic method of inspiration. And I invite you to, to listen or to read Luke chapter 1 sometime. Luke chapter 1 basically puts the entire gospel as a research project of Luke's where he accumulates all these sources, talks to people, interviews them, and puts uh, his findings into a gospel for a person named Theophilus. It's a research paper turned into Theophilus. Uh, that might be a little bit of a stretch of the imagination, but not much of one. And so there's very clear evidence that Luke used all the means that he had available to write his gospel whether it was divine inspiration, whether it was uh, being inspired to go interview someone and hear those words of Jesus, whether it was working with a gospel that already existed, like most scholars think that he did. Mark, by the way, 90% of Mark is in uh, all the other gospels, Mar Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, it's likely that they use Mark as the backbone. Interesting. There are room, there's room for those two theories to coexist together then. For this dictation method of inspiration, for uh, the verbal plenary method of inspiration to be true, and also for a dynamic kind of, of inspiration that lets a writer choose the words that they're going to use but still inspires them toward ideas and, and, and concepts. Am I making sense? Does this, is this too dense? Then let me break it down a little bit. Here's the thing about how the text is inspired. We actually don't know. We don't know how exactly it happens. Whether God is whispering it into the ear of the writer or not, whether God is taking control of the pen or taking control of our fingers as we type things out to put uh, the gospel into 21st century terms. We don't know exactly how the, these texts were passed down to us. And maybe even who was involved in the writing. Most of these things came to us today through oral tradition. And you can hear a hint of that in our passage for today. Do you remember this from our scripture reading? Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know from those from whom you learned it. There's oral tradition happening. Timothy learned these words from Paul and his grandmother, both of whom were instrumental in passing down the faith to this young man. And here's the thing about this passage. It's not even really about inspiration. We just get hung up on that because we'd like to argue with folks who disagree with our particular model for inspiration that we gravitate toward because often, because of the traditions that we have inherited it from. This text is about being equipped to be a leader in a space where one's leadership is being rejected. That was Timothy's situation. First Timothy is all about how to be a, a, a man of God or a woman of God. This, this text is about how to be a leader when those you are leading are abandoning the faith that they have inherited. And so Paul gives Timothy this charge. Pay attention to what you were taught. Stand firm in it. Remember who told you what you know. It was me, by the way. It was Paul. And your grandma. 
stand firm in it. Don't be distracted by folks who want to pull you away toward myths. And by that, I think he actually meant real mythology. But stay focused on Jesus Christ and the gospel that you have learned. And so what is it then that we've learned from this holy book right here? What is it? Hopefully it's the, the, the gospel, right? Hopefully it is full salvation. Salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Are we preaching this book both in and out of season? Uh, I forget exactly how the NRSV translates it, but that's what it means, in season and out of season. That's such an interesting phrase, isn't it? Because I'm not sure that this book, this holy book, has been in season since the Enlightenment tried to kill it. You know who this is? <laughs> that is Immanuel Kant. And I have a book of his on my bookshelf in my office called Religion Within the Limits of Re Reason Alone. I'll say that again. Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone. Do you ever read the headline of something on Facebook or on social media and, 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 and say, oh, I don't need to read anymore. <laughs> I know exactly what this says. Uh, that can get me into trouble sometimes. This book by Immanuel Kant is one of those books that I, I, I think that you can actually get away with doing that. It is what it sounds like. As the deists of the 18th century were prone to do, it takes the supernatural out of the Bible, out of the equation, and gives us a watered-down philosophy of religion that looks nothing like the Christianity of the Gospels, and you thought that the postmodernists were bad. The postmodernists have at least tried to wrestle the scalpel, scalpel out of the hands of, the, of the, the modernists of the 17th and 18th century Enlightenment thinkers who wanted to cut out all the things that they believed made Christians look stupid for believing. Subjective truth offered to us by the postmodernists is better than no truth in the Bible at all. Now, I believe that the postmodernists go too far as well. Rather, so that's maybe a little bit unfair for, for modernists, but this isn't a philosophical talk. Are we preaching this, this book in season and out of season, when it's popular to do it or when it's not popular to do it. And the point is that it's not been popular for a long time in our country and in this world. You know, I think that there's a higher truth that the Bible reveals, uh, reveals it to us even if it's not in season to admit that. I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm not ashamed of that, even if it's not in season to believe that we should be living how Jesus told us to live, which is helping the poor, the prisoner, the outcast, and the marginalized, the people that Jesus really came for, the lost sheep of Israel, is what he calls them in Matthew. It flies in the face of our rugged individualism to help others. It's anti-Darwinian for us. It's not the survival of the fittest. It's something else. It's elevating others to be more important than yourself. It flies in the face of our animal instincts. It's not in season for us to consider unconditional love to be the rule for us. And yet I believe that it is because that Christ modeled it for us that it should be our rule. It's out of season to be called to a higher way of living in which we don't sink to the levels of those who put us down and try to humiliate us and just generally act like big jerks 
and that's a pulpit appropriate account of how many in this world act toward each other. And yet God calls us to be holy because God is holy, not how I want to respond with an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, but with a vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. That's out of season. It's rolled off of our cultural menu. Cassie and I are, are big believers in, in seasonal food. We grow in our garden, uh, and I guess I, would, I should say, we is a kind of generous word toward the activity that I actually do. <laughs> Though every now and then I will keep an eye out for a plant that needs water. She is the person with the green thumb in our family. But we love to eat in places with seasonal menus. Chefs that cook with the best ingredients available from the farm to your table. And so we're actually about to enter root vegetable season, which is an excellent time to sit at a, uh, a, a table and have someone else make your dinner. Uh, kale and collard greens and uh, local lettuces and broccoli are about to be in season. And I hate it, y'all, I hate it when peaches are out of season. Peaches are my favorite fruit, and uh, Cassie makes this peach crisp, y'all. Whew. Uh, the crumble that she puts on it, I don't know if she even uses a recipe anymore. It's just second nature to her, and the amount of cinnamon that she puts in is just right. That with a scoop of ice cream, and I am in heaven. <laughs> but the point of this illustration is that just as Ecclesiastes says that there is a season for everything. There's a time for everything. Y'all know the song, Turn, Turn, Turn. It is basically Ecclesiastes. Everything has a season, a time. I'm a firm believer that this book, that the Bible, is always in season. That it always has a word for us about how we should live our lives. And it never rolls off the menu for us as Christians. It is always in season for us to use as our primary source for theological reflection. As our primary authority for how we live our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. Always primary. It's always primary for how we come to know our need for salvation. And that God is good to provide it. It's primary. Many of my friends would point to Jesus Christ as the word of God. And that is the very embodiment of God's message that scripture testifies to. That's uh, John chapter 1. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that is something I definitely agree with. But we are also people of a savior, savior named Jesus Christ who we would know relatively nothing about without this book. That makes us necessarily people of this book. But this people of the book are also always led by a spirit that does new things that its writers couldn't dream of in a time and a cultural setting that its writers could not even imagine. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit is done moving among us to do a new thing, to start fresh, and I hope you don't either. Because God's spirit is still alive, and it will never pass away, and it will always move us to start new things that are consistent with scripture. After all, another lectionary text for today comes from Jeremiah, where God promises to write a new covenant on our hearts. And because of this new covenant, we will no longer need the, the written law at all. And I eagerly anticipate that season because it's a vision of God's kingdom fully here on earth. 
would that it come soon. Are we a people who believe in the Holy Spirit as described in the Bible that refreshes and renews and starts new understandings and movements and blows whichever way it would blow? Are we a people who follow the spirit of the letters as well as the actual letters? Are we a people who would be inspired to live as God's holy people by the Holy Spirit that inspired this collection of holy writings? A people set apart by God to be God's hands and feet on this earth to those who need the help of God's people the most for their entire salvation. Are we inspired? That's the question that we should be asking. Because this book can be inspired, and it is. But if it's not inspiring us to go out and do what it says, what does it matter? Go do. Join me in it. May God make us such a people who would. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is on page 405. Seek ye first, page 405. Please stand. Receive this benediction. Go into this world and be inspired by that inspired text that's in front of you on your pew. Read it. Read it. Understand it. Meditate upon it. Receive holy knowledge from it about how you're supposed to live your life, how I'm supposed to live my life, and then go out and do it. Be inspired by that inspired text. Go and be a people of God. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.